necessarily a chronological thing. Yeah, for sure, man. Because like with you, you've got such um, you've got such a story. I mean, to the point where you're. I mean, I, and I've told you that. Like you're, you're one of the people that made me want to rap, bro. I mean, that's like you, crazy to hear that. Man. Yeah, like you and, and like and and Eminem and and Stack and White, like yeah. all you guys, man. Because yeah. it was all around that same time. Obviously, Eminem was first, but then I found out about you before I found out about Stack. No joke. Through through the Dark Days, Bright Nights. Joint. Yeah, yeah. And then I heard Stack. I was just late to the party with him, but like, and then White dropped in 03. 03, yep. But like, got me now. That um that Dark Days, Bright Nights album, bro. Well, before we get to that though, talk like from you're from Lagrange, right? I'm from Lagrange. Ta- talk about talk about George, like growing up in Georgia, because I know you was big into sports. Yeah, man. Like I, I, I grew up on a on a cattle farm. You know what I'm saying. And 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 uh, kind of the story of how it became me is, is that my dad was you know a meat cutter at the the hood grocery store in Lagrange because you know I, where I grew up was country, but it was fifty percent black, fifty percent white. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying. And so, um, literally, like I would get off the and he drove the school bus, so I would you know, be on the farm doing farm chores in the in the morning and daytime. And, you know, then I would go or I would go to school and ride the bus with my dad to the to the to the hood grocery store where he worked, which was literally right across the street from the project. And be over there from two thirty in the afternoon, three o'clock till eleven that night. Yeah. You know, and so through a lot of formative years. And so that's kind of the story of how I became who I am, you know, I always tell people, nobody just turns out the way they turn out by accident. No, not at all. You know, everybody's got a story. I mean, even, you know, anybody, any scenario you could imagine from the, the most sainted of saints to the, to the, to the person you perceive as the most evil, sadistic person, they all have a, you know, we got DNA, we got our, our makeup, and then you combine that with our experiences and then boom, that's us. Yep. And so that's the story of how I became a, country boy that, that that love rap i'd say you know mm-hmm. what i'm saying or a big part of it and um and yeah and then from the time that i can remember man like football was king in uh in in our community really everywhere in the rural south but especially like right. georgia man like it's just in in from even in metro atlanta at this point but like south georgia you know central georgia down to south georgia it's just we roll up the sidewalks on Friday night. You know what I mean? Everybody just, you're at the at the, the game, you know, high school games, eight ten thousand 10,000 people, yep. you know, routinely. And so it was just the epicenter of my community, man. And, and so from the time I was eight years old, that was, and, and to this day, football is my first love. Like, yeah. it, you know, yeah. and it's ironic because my best friend, Big Steve Herndon, my childhood best friend, you know, I've told this story many times, you know, he, he, uh, he went to Georgia, was was all SEC at Georgia, played uh, seven years in the NFL for the Broncos and Falcons. And it was ironic because his true passion was music. Like, that was his number one love. But sometimes what we're best at or, or what we care the most about, sometimes we can just turn that into a goat fuck because it – uh. You just it's like Tommy Boy said, like that sale, like I, mm-hmm. I mean, I rub it, I pet yeah. it, and I, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. With whatever we love, and so, yeah. and so maybe I just love football a little too much, but also I just wasn't good enough to go to an elite level like he was, and I kind of had him as that as that measuring stick next to me to say like, this is what greatness is, you know what I'm saying? This mm-hmm. is he was one of the top 100 most recruited players in the country our senior year. And I was a really good high school football player. Yeah. You know, and I couldn't kind of couldn't understand, you know, why I didn't understand the the potential of what they were projecting and why I wasn't being as recruited, yeah, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah. But um, you know, I I I I did go off for a little bit um out of high school and 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 try to play small college football and uh it just wasn't for me, you know, and uh and I, I was homesick had my high school sweetheart yeah and she had went to columbus state down in uh, which is like a lot of that was like the from our high school like we were 45 minutes from auburn you know a lot of people went to auburn a lot of people went to columbus state and west georgia and carrollton 
And uh, those were like the three main, you know, like if all else fails, you know, people, because, you know, it's unfortunate, man. People go to college yeah. like I did with no plan whatsoever. Yeah. College is not for everybody. No. And I would say that to, to, to any, you know, young person out there right now. If you don't have a plan, you do not have to go through the motion of wasting all that time time and, and resources, yeah. you know, because yeah. all I ultimately did was just. I would sign up for classes, get some financial aid, drop the classes. You know what I'm saying? It's mm. kind of scam the financial aid. And I had to pay every dime of that back, by the right. way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But um, so don't think there's any freebies out there either. Yeah. Like for real, for real. But um, you know, but I had no. My heart, I, I, in a general way, I wanted to coach high school football and uh, and and teach history. You know what I'm saying? That was like mm. my, but. That wasn't really what was just lighting my fire. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I I had an inkling since I was young, man. I, you know, I, I know people say stuff like this, but it's really true in my case. I just had an inkling to just, I wanted to do something big, man. And, and then my best friend being who he was, you know, and this, this we, we're not, we wasn't TV best friends. We weren't, we were real deal, yeah. you know, knee high to a grasshopper best friends. And we motivated each other and inspired each other. You know, to this day, man, you know, and I don't talk to him as much as, as, as I should, you know what I mean? But he is a big Steve. I hope you know it, man. You are a constant source of, of inspiration. His, you know, his, his son, John, his firstborn is my godson, yeah. you know, and uh, and I don't have kids. So, yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I love that guy to death because we always, no matter what was going on around us, we like brothers almost like. I kind of see Sterling and Shannon Sharp, and it's kind of similar to their stories, like yeah. coming from this country place and like, all right, so everybody else around us has this standard of expectations for their life. That's not what we're going to, you know, mm-hmm. you know, and, and to each their own, man. Everybody has, because it's almost, trust me, it's been a burden at times, that drive and that, and that, that like I said, that burning desire, inkling to, to, to do something, you know, it's, it serves you in it, and it, and it can, uh, it can hinder you. You know what I'm saying? Just, yeah, just like, sure. just like so many other things. You know what I'm saying? Just like, you know, addiction or whatever. You know, addiction may, you know, you can get addicted to doing good things too. You know what I'm saying? You, mm-hmm. you know, you can get, you know, for the process of 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 doing the things that it takes to be successful, or you can fall into the the trap of of you know doing bad shit that's going to lead to destruction. But um, you know, as far as he and I, man, it was, uh, we just demanded a lot of each other, man. And, uh, and, and encouraged each other no matter what, because obviously, you know, me saying I was going to be, when I finally did make the decision to do music, which was, uh, I would say, cause, cause I had, uh, left Tusculum college, uh, where I went to try to play football or whatever. I came back to Columbus to chase the girl, Mm -hmm. uh, attempted 38 quarter hours and got five. Yeah. And ironically enough, the music appreciation, my mom always said it was foretelling because, uh, music appreciation was the one class that I passed. And, uh, and then, you know, I kind of started going back down, you know, like, doing the local thing, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, you know, what you do if you don't have a purpose and you're 19 or 20 years old in the community, you know what I'm saying? You kind of just, I started hustling and, and, you know, and I was just not going down a good path. I would never claim to be no no kingpin or nothing like that, but I promise you I did enough to, you know, to have paid some consequences, you know? Yeah, yeah and, for sure. And I was blessed to not have. And, um, and so, and he had a, uh, an apartment. They had an extra room up. That his whole apartment was paid for by a scholarship. He said, "You need to come up here to Athens when he was living in UGA." Mm-hmm. And so that's where that transition happens. I go to Athens, met my longtime manager, my first and my manager for twenty years, Bobby Stamps. Mm-hmm. And um, shout out to Bobby, man. Um, and and we started. I started the process of taking and Bobby was childhood best friends with a guy by the name of Colt Ford. Oh, you're you know what I'm Colt. saying? Yeah. You know, people don't, I don't think a lot of people know that when I moved to Athens, one of the primary reasons I was moving is because me and Colt Ford were in a rap group. And it, this is 1990, 
seven. I think Colt told me that in that interview that I did. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and we, we did booty shake music. Yeah. And it was, our group was called One Card Shy. But it was interesting because he had, they, they had the relationship with So So Deaf. You know, yeah. uh, he was an artist. Jermaine. Yeah. Yep, yeah. With Jermaine Dupree. And uh, Shannon was a staff. Shannon Houchins, you know, now Average Joe's, was a staff producer for So So Deaf. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, uh, Colt was a, an artist at the time by the name of X Man because you got to think yeah. this is a period in the, the early nineties. This is after the Vanilla Ice yeah. thing where that was a little bit of a, a catastrophe because I guess you know and dude Vanilla Ice is the shit. Let me so, let yeah. me preface anything I say by saying that and that man sold uh, fifteen million albums and thirty million singles. Everybody was bumping Ice Ice Baby. You know <laughs> yeah, what I'm saying? Sure, like, and that shit was jamming and it's still jamming. Yeah. And so, um. So this ain't no stab, but I guess there were some discrepancies in his story, you know, or whatever. So for a while, there there was the the institution of the white rapper mm -hmm. in the in the uh, I'd say from like probably ninety two to like Eminem, yep, five it, six year period. Yeah, yeah was there was shaky. there was just nothing, you know, and you kind of had a feeling as a white boy during that time that there ain't gonna be but one more, yep. you, you know, if they ever let another one in the door, you know, and and it was hard to be a white rapper in them days, but yeah, yeah. you know. And uh, but one thing that I, that I that I definitely like after the Vanilla Ice thing, I said, man, you gotta be authentic. You know what I'm saying? Whatever your story is, you know, I, I got a lot of pride uh, pride in being from the country, man. I really do. But at the end of the day, I just had to rip that because that was mm -hmm. who I was. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And I knew that within the the framework of what hip hop is, that as long as I was being authentic. Nobody could question it. You know what I'm saying? And um and so um, you know, but this is to go back to the to the cold situation. So he was an artist called X Man. Yeah. Signed to So So Death and he wore a mask. Because, you know, Cole had a had a big he still does a, a big barrel tone, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And it was I guess for a white dude back at that time, that was pretty rare. And um and so but they want so Jermaine messed with him, but he wanted to wear the mask, or whatever. And I guess at some point they were gonna take the mask off or whatever. But anyhow, so but like I said, it wasn't a lot of luster on the whole white white boy thing at the time. And then Shannon Houchins was a uh, the staff producer for So So Deaf, and Jermaine had put them two together, and they did a project that was it's pretty dope actually. I've I've heard a lot of the songs. Uh, hey, pass me the Malibu. Like they have <laughs> yeah. they. Had, Cold and cold and shit. I mean, uh, you know, at the time X Men or whatever, they had some dope music, but uh, you know, it was just tough. It was tough to get it off. And then so basically here I come, Bobby, you know, Colt's yeah. best friend, yeah. brings this white boy in, talking about and me and Colt, because Colt was kind of in a lull and me and Colt hit it off, you know what I'm saying? I'm rapping I'm I'm working at the like, you know what I'm saying, at my pop store and like rapping on the phone to, to, to Cole, you know, we're saying verses back and forth. I'm in LaGrange and he's in Athens. So I go up there and we're going to be a rap group. But really, Shannon was just like not really checking for the whole white boy thing either. He just kind of put us together in a group, kind of to kill two birds with one stone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, man, these two annoying some bitches, man, let me just put them together, whatever. So we made some music, man. And it was, it was at a time when like, you know, uh, that music was really viable, like uh, you know, '69 Boys. Oh yeah, you know, and uh, especially like booty the, jams and all that. Yeah, shit, man, man yeah, like right. like you know, Kilo Ali in Atlanta, yeah, stuff like that. Yep. And so, and we had some jams now. Yeah, we got some jams, man. We we, I found an old jam me and Colt had uh, called "She's Got the Whole World." In a pants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, dude. Shout out to my boy uh Darnick McAlpin, but um yeah. who produced that one. But um yeah, man, so we did our thing and honestly it just um you know, it it's like we uh me and Colt have just known each other since you know, like I said, is my earliest my first time well, my second time ever going to the studio mm -hmm. was with Cole Ford. You know what I'm saying? It's, yeah. You know, we just record a song called Pop That Trunk. Yeah. You know, and that was that was definitely the first, uh, like, decent studio experience I ever had, even though I had been uh, one time before with my guy that I was in a group with down in LaGrange, and we saved up and went up to the studio in Atlanta. 
and um you know we get there we pay for a 12 hour session you know like and then we realized we didn't have any beats yeah <laughs> the guy like sat there and kind of helped made us feel like we were making the beats but made like some some very weak beats or whatever anyway and so uh yeah, man, I got great memories. That's and, and I ultimately ended up signing to Eleventh Hour Productions with Doug and Shannon mm -hmm. uh, for my first album. You know, what I'm saying when I a lot of people don't know, I was signed to Interscope for nearly a year before Timberland came into the equation. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. So um, you know, Jimmy Iovine, you know, Gerardo Mejia, Rico Suave. Mm -hmm. if, if you know, if anybody's familiar with him, he's actually the A and R. He was the first ever artist released on Interscope Records. Rico Suave, like, was the first artist ever that Interscope Records ever released. Mm -hmm. And so Jimmy Iovine was forever um, indebted to him. He gave him my A&R position. He mostly did, like, Spanish movies, Enrique Iglesias and stuff yeah. like that. But he signed me. The dude that did the Rico Suave Gerardo song? Gerardo Mejia signed me. Yes, he's the person that signed wow, me. Wow, bro, I did not know that. And, and, That's crazy. And there's a whole story behind how it ended up uh, that way, man. Um, and I don't think I've ever mentioned this on camera, but um, there was a guy. So Shan had done a production deal mm -hmm. um, with a guy named Mike Conception, who's one of the original Crips. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? This guy was like a real made L.A. guy. Mm -hmm. And there was some kind of production deal that, that they had si signed with them that I wasn't a part of this production deal. It goes even further back, and, and to tell this story, because Fred Durst from Limp Bizkit was the vice president of, of Interscope Records at the time, mm -hmm. and this is stuff. No, I don't. I really don't think that that I've ever told this story on camera because it goes so deep. Yeah. Um, Fred Durst from Limp Bizkit, vice president of Interscope, and he, this is when all the Napster stuff was going on, and I had I had released the independent version of Dark Days, Bright Night, yeah. and we were. Man, that that to say that project called Wildfire, man, it's like I always tell people to this day, there's no marketing plan like something being the shit. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Because word of mouth, when that, it's just like we're talking about with Jam Wayne right now. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. the same, it's just one one shows two, shows four, shows eight, yeah. shows sixteen, and so on and so on. And there's no marketing plan like nope. that. You know, and that's how that's what it was initially with Dark Days, Bright Nights, and so. But Doug K, who's now business affairs guy, at Average Joe's, back then, he was a guy, he had a, a distribution company called uh, Newtown Music, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. He had made a lot of money putting out, remember Tech Master PB and all those bass? Yeah, yeah. He put out all those, uh, all those, those projects. Right. So millions and millions of albums. And so, but he told us basically if we did a project that he would put it in stores, put the CDs in stores. We didn't know that, okay, that's about one-tenth of the battle because we still didn't have money to promote. But somehow, I mean, we were getting like front, you know, front row placement at Camelot, you know, yeah. back in the day. And that was like crazy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we ended up really just by word of mouth selling, you know, legitimate 5,000, you know, sound mm -hmm. scan. I, you know, a lot of people used to say those numbers, but you pull up the sound scan and it'd really be like 400. Yeah. You know, and, uh, so and that was the, that was the independent version. Yeah. That was the independent yeah. version. We're not even signed to Interscope at this time. Yeah. And, uh, so basically we're feeling ourselves a little bit, you know, and this is when the Napster stuff's going on and Fred Durst is on a live remote on MTV. And it's, uh, live from Westlake Studios on Beverly. And Doug K looks up the and sends us a box of CDs out there to that studio. It's probably a month later. Mm -hmm. Shannon calls me, Shannon Houchins calls me and says, man, you know what Fred Durst's voice would sound like? Like his real voice? I say, yeah, I would. He's like, you need to hear this voice message. Plays me a voicemail. Yo, what's up? This is Fred Durst. Just got this fucking CD. I don't know who this kid is. I can't tell if he's white or black or whatever, but this is a rapping motherfucker right here. Blah, blah, blah. He's like, you know, maybe a few. I remember he said, maybe a few hooks could be stronger here and there, but that's the least of our worries. Let me see if I get you out here to California. Blah, blah, blah. And he was a bite. And I'm, 
And I'm like, that's really Fred Durst, dog. Yeah. I was like, we out of here. I was like, we out of here. Yeah. You know, so, but Fred, me not knowing how the business works at that time. So I have one conversation, I think, with Fred. And he's like, I'm going to call you back. All right, then months go by. You know, type yeah. shit. You know how that shit goes. And so, uh, but then he calls me one day and he's like, uh, he says, man, there's these guys up here uh, at Warner Brothers saying that they uh that that they got you signed and 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 uh and I told them that Bubba Sparks is my artist blah 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 his name's Craig or something like that and 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 uh and he's like telling me that he's barking on the guy like and this is like after months of no contact with yeah. Fred and I'm like man nobody got me you know I'm yeah. signing my product the production company but I you know and he's like uh he's like yeah fuck him he's like now nah, how, how I tell you how green I was he said. How soon can you get out here to California? I had a, a 78 Nissan Courier truck yeah. at the time. And I said, man, I don't know, man. I said, because, you know, I don't think my truck will make it out there. Yeah. I was thinking he was saying drive to California. Yeah. He was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, nah, fuck face. I'm going to fly you out here. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, all right, uh, yeah. But I'd never flown either. So I was there. I had trepidation uh, associated with that, too. I was really, you know, a little uneasy mm -hmm. about flying. And anyway, so, and then come to find out what had happened was Fred, Craig Nobles, the guy that, that he got into it with at, at uh, Warner Brothers, worked for Mike Conception's label. So Mike Conception, the crypt dude, was claiming me based on a deal that, he, a production deal that he they had done with Shannon and them for mm -hmm. some other artists that I wasn't even a part of in yeah. the if I'm not the check bounced on the deal, even, yeah. even, even, even right. so. Even for if the, you were a part of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the deal never went down. Yeah. But this guy just on it, on that, you know what I'm saying? So he just claiming whatever. And people don't know this history of, of this is why, like, you know, it's good to tell this because I really want to do a documentary or something soon. And it, trust me, there's a lot of other shit that I hadn't, that I hadn't mm -hmm. really touched on too. But anyway, and so basically, Fred doesn't realize who he's talking to, but he's talking to a representative of Mike Conception. Mm -hmm. And uh, he finds out. And basically they say, like, you know, white boy, we, we go, we'll knock your fucking head off your shoulders. Like, you know, blah, blah, yeah. blah. So he calls me the next day and he's like, yo, I got to pay my respects to these dudes, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you pussy ass bitch. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm not signed to these motherfuckers. Like, because yeah. I don't give a fuck. At the time, it's like, my life is worth, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, they're claiming me. They don't have me signed. The original deal that they're even trying to wrap me up in the check bounce on, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. and they're trying to keep Fred Durst. You got to understand how big Limp Biscuit was at this time. Oh, Limp yeah, Biscuit was the biggest thing on yeah, earth dude. at that time. Was that right before? Was that right before uh, the break stuff and Nookie and all that? Or was that, that was after that? After that, okay. because he yeah. was the vice president of Interscope. Yeah, that's probably how. Yeah. yeah, okay. He was like this. This is like the time. I tell you what, um, rolling, rolling yeah. was was like the song that was out around that yeah. time. And um, now my mouth's dry. We had that water over there. Yeah, bro. Dry as fuck. And uh, so, and I'm just like fuck life. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like. And that's crazy, dude. And to the point where he put it on the back burner, and they still weren't doing shit. Mm -hmm. The other people that, you know, they, they didn't have a plan for me or anything. They were just basically people out in that, that setting. They like to just, all right, I'm just going to, until we can figure out something, like, it might be never, but nobody else is going to gonna do shit with you. You know right. what I'm saying? Yeah. That was kind of the mindset. And I'm just like, fuck this shit. So I go back to work. I'm working three jobs, man, and selling mid-grade weed, working at a liquor store, doing landscaping at, at Paul Brown Motors, which was uh, Colt Ford's father, you know what I'm saying, their yeah. car lot. Just kind of piecing stuff together. Yeah, right? and yeah. driving, you know, 45 minutes, uh, three nights a week to get mm -hmm. in the studio with Shan up in Atlanta, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so he was living in Swanee. But, you know, that was a, that was a rough year, man, but it was a defining year. Um, after thinking that it was on and then it not being, you know, I really 
found out a lot about who I was because my the, the girl that was my everything at the time, Melanie McDougal, this chick, had basically broken up with me around the same time because basically because I was a loser, you know, and her family didn't necessarily think I was ever going to turn out to be anything, and I was this rapper saying I was going to be a rapper, and it just wasn't. That shit's cute at first, you know what I'm saying, yeah. but but it loses its luster pretty quickly. Especially back then. Yeah, back yeah. this is 1999. Yeah, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like, it was like two. I mean, dude, Eminem had came out, yeah. and you know, dude, I dude, I had made it before people started snickering behind, my, stopped snickering behind my back. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. like I had that. I, that's what a lot of people don't understand about the, the way I carried the country flag for years and years and years. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like. Like, there's a lot of people doing this shit now that, that snickered uh, at me about being country and stuff that are, you know, that are that are doing country type stuff now. And it's like, what do, what do you think? What do you when you see stuff like that? What, how does what do you think about all that? Do you just laugh at it or do you? I have to, man. Yeah. You know, I have to because. It, it, and I gave up a long time ago on feeling like I had to. I'm, it's not I'm not going to be the person that polices my credit. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm, I'm not gonna go police every example of where I deserve credit for this or that. You know, I'm not doing that, man. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. I just, I, I'm gonna be at peace with the fact that God's gonna sort it out, however it's supposed to be. And it may be long after I'm gone, man. You know what yeah. I'm saying? It may be. Yeah. But if you check the facts and you go back through, if we're talking about country people now, I, it's this whole genre has morphed into like. Like non-major label white rappers is basically what it's turned into. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. like if you uh, Jack Harlow, you know that mm -hmm. that's that's another that's another strat. Basically, like what I was at my peak. You know yep. what I'm saying? Like, yep. like that's another category still. But you know these older guys, man, that that are finally getting their chance, man. There was a lot of dope guys that could have you know could have been Bubba Sparks. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Or you know in theory, they couldn't have been because if they would could have been, they would have been. Right. If they could have invented Facebook, they would have invented Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, nah, but um, you know, it's always a great thing, man. It really is. You know what I'm saying? And I, and I, I'm grateful to have. I think if 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 if, if, if when I think about my long lasting contributions, man, like um, it's just maybe I was one of the first people that just said it's okay to not be from New York, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. I, cause I remember feeling so inferior being around JD Kiss and those guys. Cause they had the real rap story. Yeah, You know what I'm saying? They yeah. were from New York, they the blocking Yorkers, you know yeah, what I'm saying? And I'm yeah. up there in the studio with them. They get, they were the real rappers with the real, and you know, it, it, there, there was just no reference point for what I was doing at the time and for me being me, man. And, and I don't know how I had the courage to keep going sometimes and to, yeah. and to go represent me. You know, and just, you know, I think about my high school football coach used to say, you know, when we would get ready to play game, you know, mm -hmm. where it was like we were the underdog or something. He said, guys, you don't have to take a back seat to anything or anybody. Coach Jim Holly. And I'll never forget it. That just that stuck in my psyche. Like when I'm doing Saturday Night Live and stuff where I really didn't feel like I, I had imposter syndrome, I think is mm -hmm. what it's called. I didn't think that I deserved to be there really, you know, deep down. Like I, I and I just that I, that that saying would just like stick it. I don't have to take a back seat to anything or anybody. If I take if I get in the back seat, it's because I chose to. Yeah, you know what I mean. And yeah, I yeah. I tell people that in life, and that's not to say you don't put yourself on a pedestal of thinking you're better than anybody, but but just know you really don't have to take a back seat to anybody. You know what I mean? Like that's nobody, right, you know, you j people have different gifts. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? And and. And their gifts may not be what may your gifts may not be what their gifts are, or vice versa. Yep. But the longer you live, that's true humility is understanding that we all have certain gifts. You know what I'm saying? We we and and none of us are the same. You know what I mean? And 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 uh, and just kind of being okay with that. The fact that I, nobody has everything, the total package. Nobody looks like Brad Pitt and has. Right. You know, has the time, and has a yeah. fourteen inch dick, and can you know <laughs> what? Right. Yeah. You know, I'm the closest thing to it though, like, you know, so. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, yeah. So you know, it, it it just being going back to what I feel like is my lasting contribution is just like 
nowadays you can pretty much be from anywhere look any kind of way mm -hmm. and be a rapper and be you know and yeah. and, and that's great man but you gotta you gotta say like 2001 there weren't a lot of examples of anything other than just you know i guess having outcast as my as my you know those are my idols yeah, you know what i'm saying the sure. dungeon family and the way they were it, it gave me hope to say well if there are ears for their voices there might be ears for my voice because you know they were pretty different and and um and just alternative at the time and just progressive and something that people had never seen so not to say that, that my thing was like outcast but just to say that it gave it was the lily pad of 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 um of confidence you know what i'm saying as you hop from lily pad to lily pad yeah. so to speak of like of looking for things that that, that will keep you going you know yeah. what i'm saying like yeah. you know outcast was a big part of my story you know yeah. like as far as like man when i that that gave me they just to this day man you know even you know i did business with big boy and it didn't necessarily go the way I, we all wanted it to but man like I love Outcast. You know what I'm saying? Like I love the Dungeon Family. To be a member of the Dungeon Family, like it's just beyond. And there's so many things we could literally sit here and talk for eight hours. Yeah, yeah. you know what I'm saying. And I know I I, I keep skipping, but it's like no, when it's I fine, but when I but when I think about all the things out, you know, because us having been such a delay, you know, just for different reasons, my bullshit a lot of times, whatever. Um, just of us not being able to get together, man. Like yeah. I, I, there were certain things that I just wanted to preserve. I, I knew I wanted to be special. It's like when I did the the podcast with Squints yeah. that time. You know what yeah. I'm saying? That was that was pretty special. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and so I value what you guys are doing. You know what I mean? And 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 thankful. You know that 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 you've been as persistent as you have and yeah. making sure this happened because and so I there were a lot of things that I still wanted. Like I said, I had a few things tucked for no, you. For sure. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. And, and and the my conception thing is is one of them. But to to put a bow on that, all right. So and I'll let you just have fun editing all this. Shit. No, yeah, you're good. no, it's fine, bro. <laughs> and, yeah, so, um, and so, um, and so, uh so here, so a year goes by. Mm -hmm. We get a call from a guy named Eric Williams who doesn't get enough credit in the story. He was a photographer. He was he was working, I think, as an A&R admin at Interscope out in L.A. Yeah. He was from Atlanta. And he had come across the Dark Days, Bright Night CD. And just much like anybody that heard it was just like, what the fuck is this? And he takes it to the desk of Gerardo Mejia, mm -hmm. who, if people don't know about Gerardo, Gerardo is Mexican-American. Mm -hmm. And he is a born again Christian now. He's actually a preacher here in uh, in Kentucky somewhere. Shout oh, wow. out to Gerardo. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And Gerardo, I, I want to apologize for, you know, I have not made perhaps at times telling my story. I have not made you uh, a prominent enough fixture. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and emphasized all that you did for me. And I just want to say thank you, man. Yeah. And uh, that is something that I have I have corrected. And you know, and we're gonna get it right. But um, so Gerardo is, I don't know how they worked it out. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. basically Gerardo wasn't scared. Fred Durst was scared. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, he, G Gerardo was in Colors, the movie Colors. Oh, fire. You know, the real, like the Did real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, but I forget his, his, but he's like the most flamboyant of the Mex Mexican guys. Like, yeah. Anyway, he just was. From over there and a part of that and like, you know, on own business. Yeah. Perched on the commerce. And so, um, get it? <laughs> Perching on the commerce, standing on business. Yeah. <laughs> Fire, bro. Fuck with me. I like that, bro. <laughs> Perching on the commerce. And so uh <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. I like that, dude. Y'all can have that one, man. Nah, that's you, bro. Nah, let the let let, let, let these other guys out here. Y'all can have that one, man. Yeah, dude. Cause I wanted to name that me and Dusty's album. Dusty's like, these country motherfuckers ain't gonna know what the hell that means. <laughs> I'm like, but well, we gotta we gotta teach them new words, man. Come yeah. on. You know, I'm gonna expanded vocabulary as some. Bitch. Always, bro. Always. And so, uh, you know, uh, so Gerardo puts it in motion, and I'll tell you how how crucial it was. I think Jimmy ended up 
you know, getting with Mike. You know, shout out to Mike Conception, man. I, I'm not sure if he's still living or not, but it's all love and respect, big dog. I yeah. still, you know, uh, I'm just retelling the story. And um, and so uh, it got solved some kind of way, but but it was to the point where I was so over the whole situation. Shannon and them are calling me. We have flights booked to go to L.A. to meet with Interscope Records. Mm-hmm. And I'm, they can't find me. Like, I'm like, because I'm like, man, I ain't going no more. I, I, I'm not going for that bullshit of getting let down and all that shit no more. Yeah. I'm 22 years old at the time. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so. They did the college try and then all that stuff. And then now you're doing the. Yeah. Man, I'm doing the music, but yeah. it's like I really done gave up on it. You know what I'm saying? I'm really yeah, like. trying to figure shit out. I'm just trying to figure out what I'm going to do in life, man. I'm feeling like a real fucking loser. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, because you, when you're 22, you got this sense of thinking that you're grown, but you're really like not. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like, if you're 22 years old, if you're anywhere under 30 and you haven't figured it out, don't panic. Yeah. Please don't panic. Yeah. And, 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 and allow yourself to do something stupid. Like, yeah. just do not panic, man. Like. You do not have to, we're not on a, a, a time scale uh, clock of a, a rush to figure things out. We're not. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Now, if you have a child and you bring a child into this world, true enough, you got to figure out that child, yeah. getting that child's belly full becomes priority one. You know right. what I'm saying? But yeah. aside from that, don't panic. These women think they got to be married by the time they're 30 years old or if they're if their whole life isn't planned out by the time they're 30 years old, or they're going to melt or some shit like mm. that. Let go of that illusion. That That's that programming of bullshit. You know what I mean? And, um, and it's just not the case, you know what I'm saying? And so I was at a point where I was 22 years old and, and coming from a rural community. Like I did, all my friends are starting to get close. You know, they're either graduating college or, or they're, they're, they're working at the factory and they're, you know, and, and they're doing secure and solid in that role, you know, and they're making good money and driving a new truck or something. Yeah. Or, you know, they're in the military. A lot of guys went to the yeah. military, um, you know, and, and, and then some people went to the streets, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And some people, we, we, we lost people. I mean, trust me, if you don't think that, like, Especially today in, in, in rural communities. There's there's a in LaGrange, Georgia, there's a murder every two weeks. You know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. There's multiple blood sets of gangs, like you know yeah. what I'm saying? And so it's you know, and it's still a town of forty, fifty thousand people. Yeah. You know. That's I would com- I would compare it to like not as big as Clarksville, I'd say more like Columbia maybe like yeah. a little bigger than Columbia, Tennessee or something, you know? Yeah. And I know there's gangs in Columbia, Tennessee, but yeah, um, that's crazy. I, I'm just saying, like, you know, it's a, it's a real place, you know what I'm saying? And it wasn't, I come from the fighting era, you know what I'm saying? We we, mm. we, we threw hands. Like, you you did not get no respect as a man if you if you wouldn't at least put them hands up and fight yeah. when I was growing up. But we did not know nothing about, we, guns was for hunting or for yeah, yeah. rare instances. Not for solving a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. we didn't, you know, I seen a guy get hit with a tire tool one night at the movie theater and get this all this and that's about the worst most violent thing i you know when i was young that i saw like all his teeth just went flying everywhere Mm -hmm. like but you know and that's pretty violent actually when you think about it (laughs) shout out to i ain't gonna say his name who did it i don't know if it it was ever any repercussions of that or not but he did it on behalf of us man so shout out big dog yeah and uh um you know, um, Gerardo. Yeah. And so I signed Interscope Records. Mm-hmm. Um, what year was this? This, this was 2000. 2000, okay. But late in 2000. Right. I was 22, and uh, and you know what the song that got us signed? Was it from Dark Days, Dark Nights? Country Folks. Okay, yeah, yeah. Not Country Folks, the, not, not the new one. Yeah. Not the one that just went gold. And Doug K kept harping on me redoing that and still we need to do country re, redo country folks and the is shit it even on the Interscope version? Mm-mm. And I'm glad too because it was like it was a direct sample of Country Boy Can't Survive. Oh, gotcha. Okay. It was like I might talk slow, but I'm feeling fine, and country folks show can ride. Oh, uh, okay. I ain't got no yeah. eyes because without it I shine. 
Country for show can ride. <laughs> I forget. I even forget. So I that, that's what got the attention and got interest. Well, country. that was the thing that made them be like, I mean, yeah, trust me, Jimmy Ivy ain't got it. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, he got it when he, you know, when he heard well water and all my, you know, like that. I was yeah. really on some like. Well water was so fire. Man, bro. I was on some like. New South shit, Absolutely. you know what I'm saying? Like, I was yeah. trying to build a bridge, between, which I feel like has been my purpose in life, and I I feel like failed at certain times, and is is being a bridge between poor, you know, un making poor Southern whites and blacks understand that they're, they're not any different. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. The only difference is what, what we've allowed programming to make us think makes us different. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's like, real. And so... um you know that's kind of been my my cross to bear for life you know and and uh and so um you know back in those days it was it and it still it still bleeds through in my music you know what i'm saying because Sorry. because i've always been the kind of person that was more like attraction over promotion mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying i i know that if I say something directly, if I'm known as the guy that's out here preaching, you know, like, now, yeah. it, unfortunately, with the way country rap has evolved at certain times, I've had to kind of put on the hat of making it seem like I was on some, like, you yeah. know. Yeah. But that's just very simple shit to me. That's just, I just want people to put, stop pretending that country rap is a new invention. You know what I'm saying? Right. This is hip hop. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And. There's a certain way, if you're going to participate in hip-hop, I feel like there's a certain, um, you know, homage that you owe to Absolutely. the people that created this music and culture. You know what I'm saying? Black and brown people. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And so yeah. when you start talking about, you know, flags that fucking, like, rep you know, I just, you know, that's just not, that's not me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I, yeah, yeah. To each their own, I guess. You know what I'm saying? But. It's still this is this is hip hop music. This you can call it hip hop or whatever. But it's not a new creation. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Like let's let's let, let, let's stop there at least. Right. Let's let's all like you know at least recognize that that's a fact. You know what I'm saying? That this mm -hmm. is not you know just just because we go out and have a bonfire you know in the middle of the woods and and um, you know, and rap about trucks and dirt roads and stuff, that doesn't mean that this is a, a whole new, it's not a genre, it's a subgenre, you know, of yeah. hip hop. And yeah. that that's kind of my thing. But but aside from that, man, I've always just I'm I'm an example of, of what I believe to be the principles, you know, that that um and most times in my life, but always in my music, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Do as I say, not as I do. No, <laughs> but, uh, right. no but no, but um, you know, I um, I try to exude the principles of just, you know, you can see this is, and a lot of people read the book. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. A lot of people like, man, got it. What I was trying to accomplish, as far as like, you know, I don't want it to ever seem like I'm just blatantly trying to, um, be on some kumbaya or no shit like that. But it's like, man, like. We kick it a certain way, and this is how we do it. And we, you know, and and, and the principles of, of the kind of men we're striving to be, and the things that we want to represent, and within our communities, and and you know, I got brothers that are all kind of different colors. You know, I can choose my family and life. You know, what I'm saying as far as like my brothers are not based on colors. It's based on we share the same ideals and principles. You know what I'm saying? And I got brothers that look all kind of ways. So that's what that is. You know, and and that's those types of themes being prevalent within my music. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. and and um, but it's still making it it be clear that it's a natural thing too. You know, I I just um, I just think that there's certain things, man. It's just right and wrong. It's not that complicated. Yeah. You know, and and I think that we in this politically charged era that we live in, I think things can kind of get um, cloudy. You know, no, for sure. things that 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 we know in our hearts are very simple. You know what I'm saying? But in this, in this, this, you know, we just we allow these these phones, man, to do a number on us. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, absolutely. you know, in social media, you know, something that was in theory designed to bring some people together, like this, pulling people apart so much from, you know, different the two political sides to. To uh, men and women, you know what yeah. I'm saying? It's just insane, bro. No, it really is, especially compared to what it, the way things used to be. Yeah. 
Um, so when here's what what I want yeah, to ask you too. To, help so, me land some shit. No, you good. <laughs> so you signed with Interscope in two thousand. Mm. Signed with Interscope in two thousand, yeah. and um, and Jimmy had just pulled off the move with Dre and Eminem. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So he he knew like. He tried to put me with Swiss Beats. Yeah. We didn't have a net. We, you know, Swiss is my dog. You know what I'm saying? Super cool guy. And we just didn't have that musical connection. I don't think mm -hmm. culturally he quite understood. He he was 100% in tune with the fact that I was an MC. Yeah. And he loved that part of me. Yeah. But he just, culturally, he just wasn't in tune with, with the sound that he was, he was trying. Well, and even the themes of what I was supposed right, to be. What, you talking know, about, what yeah. I was representing. You know what I'm saying? Like what yeah. I was standing on. Well, that commerce I was perched, perching on, and uh, and so that was failed. Um, you know, I wanted organized noise. I had a history with Rico at that time, man, and and uh, but the thing with Rico and them is they were going through a transition period because they had just had a big thirty million dollar deal with Interscope mm -hmm. that didn't really work out the way everybody wanted it to work out, and so. They had just kind of all parted ways like a bank robbery, like short around the time I come in. And so even though I, I got where Rico and then we made music, it wasn't the that would have been my dream. I, I was Dungeon Family in my heart, you know, from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And um, and and Rico ended up being a real life friend. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. a brother that uh, I'd say there's probably five people I've met through music that actually turned out to be like real life. Brothers, Petey Pablo, True Life. Um, oh, Petey would be a fan. I'd love to interview Petey Pablo. Oh, man, I, I'll get you, Petey. Yeah, man, Petey is my brother, man. Yeah. Like, and, you know what I'm saying? Like, no matter what happens, we go years without talking. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And that Pick love, right back up. That love yeah. is still, is still, um, it, it's unwavering, man. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And, and, uh, and y'all's career seems like they kind of paralleled in the sense of like who you worked with and then like, well, certain songs, if you think you know about it, saying? Ugly and Raise Up, yep. Miss New Booty and Freakly, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, and it was both like the tie with Timbaland. And me, well. and, me yeah. and Petey are going to do an album together that would be fire. In, in 2024 as well. Like, like that's that's a fact. You know what I'm saying? We've Hell been yeah. Moses and Andy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And we've been talking about it for so long. Man, I love Petey Pablo. Man, you talk about one of the realest. Even our torment is similar. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like the... You know, the things that, I mean, his story is way different than mine. You know, two prison stints, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. the man has endured, literally fought wars on on top of wars, you know. Um, not to mention his his uh, music business, you know. I don't know if you know the, recall the full thing of all PD's, you know, been through in his business, man. Like, and uh, he's endured a lot, man, and his he's doing great in life. You know what yeah. I'm saying? This man just turned 50. He, I talked to him. He's in Spain on his 50th yeah. birthday. You know what I'm saying? Kicking it like yeah. that's man. That's my dog. I love Petey Pablo. I, if he call, if he needed me, and he called me right now, I'd be there by dark tonight. Yep. I promise you that. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Like if he really really needed me. Yeah, that's cool. And, and and I know that that that's reciprocated, and it yeah. always has been. But like I said, I'm my go. Me and Petey also, you know, we we brothers, and so we we might spend like, you know, about a week, ten days together. You know what I'm saying? Because we we worked on some music a few years ago, and we was we was together for about about nine, ten days. Boy, we we get real brotherly. You know what I'm saying? Getting on yeah. each other's nerves and shit too. You know, yeah. <laughs> but man, you know that's man. I I just got so much love for Petey, man. Like me and him and. and you know, our relationship with Timberland, you know, has has been very comparable to, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, like yeah. like the different ups and downs and stuff and and uh yeah, be looking short story long, be looking for that Moses and Andy oh, in twenty twenty four. That's yeah. on God. Yeah, he he went in on that on that new uh song with, that he did with church too. Man, he he killed the song yeah. with Up Church, yeah. man. And that was dope as hell to me. You know yeah, what I'm I saying? So too, and, yeah. and shout out to Up Church for, yeah. for that, man. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. Man, that is just one of the. I was like, man, all right, church, I see you, big yeah, dog. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, yeah, and cool. uh, and and the same for Petey. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And man, like that had me think. We need an up church and Petey album. That's uh, yeah. that's what we need. Yeah. 
Yeah, that shit was fire. And man. I want to feature on it, so Absolutely. let's get it. Yeah. And um, so I had a question too that I've always wondered. To, uh, you spoke briefly about it with Squizzles too on the pod, but the whole when Jimmy Iovine and the Interscope thing. Okay. What about the comparisons you were getting to Eminem? Speak about Eminem for a minute. Yeah, man. You know, uh, how, how, and, how and was, when I talked about that on Vlad, or you know, I forget it was one of those podcasts or whatever where I mentioned that. And of course, when they take the sound bite, you know, what I'm yeah. saying. And they make it seem like I was saying, I failed to live up to be Eminem. That's, you have to think about the context of the time that we were in. You know what I'm saying? They don't like, put that on there, though. Yeah, they don't do that. They just no, wanted to, you know, we're going to take care of you. And then a bunch of hating ass bitches get on there and talk, you know, and that, that just makes me not pay attention to comments ever. Yeah. Basically is what it does. Yeah. And, um, and so, um, man, Eminem was Eminem. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We're in the same building. You have to yeah. think about that. So after failed attempts at putting me with uh, Swiss Beats, uh, Jimmy calls me one night and says, "I'm getting ready to meet with this guy, uh, Timberland. Um, what do you think about if I play him your stuff?" Said Jimmy, "That'd be perfect, but yeah. but <laughs> hey, <laughs> that'd be perfect. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like I cannot tell you how sonically that I knew. I, I just already saw the whole." Because he had the stuff crushing with Aaliyah. And oh, man. He was. That, I'll tell you what, what was the record that was out. Yeah. Get yeah. your freak on. Yeah. You know, and and yeah. uh, and uh so, you know, he played. Next day, I was on a flight. I was going to L.A. And, and, and so, and Beat Club, and, and, you know, I was the first ever artist Timberland released. And, you know, and, and man, we, we failed in some ways, but we, we did – a lot of great shit together, man. You know what I'm saying? And um, and Dr. Dre and Eminem were in the same building. The co comparisons were inevitable. Yeah. But people don't realize when I say I failed to live up to Emin to being Eminem. Okay, so you think okay, Eminem can rap? You know what I'm saying? Like culturally, we are two different things. Absolutely. And. Bubba Sparks could always exist in the same world, same room as Eminem, because y'all may take it for granted now, being Southern and country, you know what I'm saying? But at the time, it was, it was special. It was a special thing, because I was representing, a, there was a pocket left of society left, a void almost. Everybody couldn't get with Eminem. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? As far as white boys out here, you know what I'm saying? Like, he represented, man, and golly, man. And Eminem ain't never did nothing but show me love. Yep. But I'm saying there was a small pocket of people, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. in, when him and Stax, or Stax crusade against him later on or whatever, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Kind of capitalized on that pocket. Yeah. But I just approached it from a love perspective. You know what I'm saying? Right, like, right, right. Yeah. like I was like basically saying like, you know, you know, I said it on the Archie song. I said, uh, I always had to start the whole verse to get to the point. Oh, Bubble, good. baby, trouble, baby, did my thing. Love, love me, hate me. All in London, yelling, Georgia, your old bitty suffocate me. Hold it down for country crackers. Lead the mothers up to shady. Yep. You know what I'm saying? I so, still think that's my favorite verse you've probably ever read. Man, I murdered that, bro. Yeah. I remember T.I. called me and was like, man, rest in peace, Archie Eversoul, no, man. Sure, man. Thank you, man. You yeah. and Mason put me on that song because, yeah. you know, that was a look, man, that it, it, endure, it endures to this day, you know what I'm saying, in every mm -hmm. stadium or whatever, you know. And uh, I, don't, I don't think people think about those kind of things always when they think about, the, the, you know, my – my history or whatever, but you know, the you think they just think about new booty. Is that the first thing that comes I, a lot? I think of new booty is what fucked it up. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think, I think new booty is because that made it a weird room to be in my mm -hmm. shows. You know what I'm saying? Because you got these people that my first two albums, man, they fucking like dark. Day I'm the only person that. that's ever existed in this world yeah. that could have made my first two albums. That's what you, as an artist, that's what you should. That's your goal. Like if you if you make a project and you look at it or you create a piece of art, you say, "Damn, I'm, there's another person that could have done this." Not saying because it's better or worse, but saying because mm -hmm. it's so uniquely you. Yep. You know, like I'm, I'll stand on that. I'll perch on that. 
So do you, do you feel like Miss New Booty was a gift and a curse? It was a very much a gift and a curse. Yeah. You know, and if I could go back and hey man, many 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 millions, and it will go diamond. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like in in the not so distant future. But and so I'm grateful for the financial gains of that song, and I am so thankful for it because it was at a time when it was necessity. I needed that record. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because there was only four ways that people take it take uh, this for granted as well in this era. You know what I'm saying? Having direct access to your fans and being able mm -hmm. to define your fan base in such detail. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like you didn't have that opportunity back then. Like it was CDs in the stores, yeah. live shows, yeah. FM radio, MTV, BET. Those are the only ways you. So if you could. You had to make your product fit in a box that was serviceable mm -hmm. through those fucking like um, outlets. Yeah, and, and and when you said you needed that record, this was the charm, right? So this was post. So what time. happens is I come out, sell one point four million with Dark Days, Bright Nights. You know, what I'm saying it was still mm -hmm. a, in that building. It was a letdown. It was a disappointment. That's crazy. It's um, crazy that one point four. Yeah, million that I sold two hundred thousand records the first week. And it was, they were projecting, I had shipped 700,000 units. And um, they were projecting, because Eminem's first album sold 350 the first week. Yeah. And he, the competition was, and I was projected to sell 400 and top, and that within the building, that was the competition. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, yeah. that was the talk. And we were expecting to sell 400, but Eminem had so much back history that I didn't, the first thing people saw of me was ugly. I had one piece of evidence out there. Mm -hmm. Eminem had Lyricist Lounge. You know what I'm saying? Um, and even though you're snapping on that song, the visuals of that maybe it, it, made, it made it a think, bit. Oh, he's just some country bump. And it made it seem, yep. you know, it ostracized. Yep. It, it was uh, polarizing. Yep. You know, you could love it or you could hate it. You yep. know what I'm saying? Like, I don't want, because this was when that wasn't country dudes. Uh, it it literally seemed like hee haw. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It seemed like the show hee haw. Yeah. One hundred percent. And uh and honestly Hold on. There you go. I'm on, I'm Charlie on. Charlie P texting me right now, like all right, so go ahead. We left off with M. Yeah, man, but but uh, early on, man, because that was back in a time when people didn't collaborate, especially two white rappers. Like you know, mm -hmm. collaboration was out the door. But the Shady Records family, Paul Rosenberg, Mark LaBelle, Tracy Agnew. I mean, uh, all those guys just they they showed me so much love. You know, what I'm saying mm -hmm. from Dr. Dre too. You know, like when uh. You know, Dr. Dre shouted me out on TRL, which was a big thing back then, man. Like, uh, he put uh, Bubba Talk on the Wash soundtrack. Mm -hmm. You know, it, we were there was never a friction between us all. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. and that's part of the the atmosphere that Jimmy facilitated. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. there, you don't really ever back in those days. You know, the G Unit in ter turmoil stuff, inner turmoil stuff came. But that was a different thing. But as far as Interscope artists, you don't ever remember like petty jealousies. Because first of all, Jimmy paid everybody very well and took care of everybody. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like it was, you know, I when I the 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 conditions that I left Interscope under, um, because we come out, we do 1.4 million, and then um, Deliverance, we take a gamble on the sound of Deliverance. Me and Tim did. And uh, we gambled on 10 million, you know what I'm saying? But the world just wasn't ready for it at the time. And um, and we dropped at a time where we come with, nah, 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 and mm -hmm. guess what's all over the radio? Keep in mind, we still look, you have those four outlets, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But, nah, 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 and the whole world is on some, get low, get low you yeah, know yeah, and we still yeah. went top 10 that shows you how big of a beast interscope how how yeah, how awesome that record was for one but for sure but also just how um how big of a beast interscope records was you know so that shit went top 10 yeah at urban radio at that time you know yeah. what i mean yeah. and, but anyhow and so and deliverance just went gold man like not too long ago and oh, the charm awesome, is man. the charm is gold as well 
So all three of my major label releases, and then, you know, I mean, um, Miss New Booty is Miss New Booty, but um, the Deliverance single is gold or platinum. Like, I just went and, and, you know, basically, like, looked at all the certifications of everything. Or my man manager, Boogie Jason Brown. Um, I got two managers, Charlie P and Boogie Jason Brown. Damn. But um, he went and, and looked at all my chart. Like, it's crazy, the records from back in the day that I had that are like we ready is like mm -hmm. multi platinum, you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, the uh the the um Jadakiss record, you know what I mean? Love that record, bro. Yeah, Rough Riders joint. Yeah, man, that's crazy. Like like to think about some you know, and and I'm your Wikipedia page is like your I've had a battle with my Wikipedia page of trying to get yeah you know, the right information on there and stuff, but we're about to go back in there and, and you know, because that's, that's like your calling card this, these days, you know yeah. what I'm saying? And that bullshit-ass fucking, like, uh, Google worth shit, like, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, it's yeah. like, how, does it occur to anyone, like, how would they know what every person's holdings are? You know what right. I'm saying? Right, yeah, dude. <laughs> Those are fucking websites that are guessing at shit, period. Yeah. No, 100%. Because I'm going to tell you, like, there's a lot of people on that motherfucker that I know for a fact they they're worth a lot less, and there's a lot of people that I know that are worth a lot more. Yeah, and yeah. I'm one of them for sure. Yeah, yeah. Just like in that Cat Williams interview, when they said Google, Google's gonna say my net worth is two million, sometimes that's what I have on me. Yeah, nah. In jewelry, for sure. So, so like, so you, so I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, I mean, but, dude, I I I'll. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll a lot of land in Georgia. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> like, like that. Uh, that a loan is worth, you know, a yeah. good bit more than what they would say my, my worth is, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so, you know, that's one thing my pops taught me a long time ago was that, uh, you know, that land is the most valuable resource. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the one thing they can't make no more of, you yeah. know? Yeah. And so, in spite of all my frailties and all the, you know, my many shortcomings, mm -hmm. duly noted and, and, and often broadcast, by those from glass houses, but um, you know I um, I'm a flawed man. I really yeah. am. Like you know, and I I would, but part of it is this, Chad, is the fact that I have 23 years of being. What what what? Uh, Dark Knight say you either die the hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. You yeah. know the villain. You know, and yeah. and all my ups and downs in life, man, like. You know, I, I just have no doubt, man, that I, I've, I've lived this life with pure intentions, with a pure heart. Mm -hmm. I've always, I, I've, I've never intentionally fucked anybody over, man. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? I, I really never have. Um, and I just, I've just always tried to be a love-based person, man. You know, I really have. And, 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 um, and shit gets fucked up. And the more of a spotlight you have shining on you, the more it's going to be, um, you know, and the longer you go, the, 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 the brighter the light is shining on you. And the longer you go, the more the chances of something bad happening. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It, but they don't highlight good. You know what I'm saying? It's just it, for some reason in this world, man, we like to tear people down. And so we, we just we highlight negative things. You know what I'm saying? And we, we harp on negative things, even in my own. I had to stop looking at comments, dude. I, I have I had a, a guilty pleasure chat. I um I would Google my name on Twitter. All different spellings. Mm -hmm. And dude, it was um it was like torment. You know what I'm saying? It was like good because you know, like I look at a hundred YouTube comments and be like, okay, ninety-seven positive love and then there was two fucking comments where it's like you just sit there and harp on them you know and that's just the human experience unfortunately i think that's like our psyche but um here's something i wanted to ask you to speak about briefly like do you want to speak about uh battling addiction i would love to yeah um it's been a lifelong and it's a lifelong battle you know what i'm mm -hmm. saying and um, and unfortunately, with addiction, man, it's like it can rear its head in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. 
You know, it's like even in time, there's been times where, you know, I've had two years, I went two years, you know, in the program and didn't drink or, or do any drug for two years, you know what I'm saying? And, yeah. and, um, and that was probably the closest I've ever been to suicide in my life. You know, when you, when you were sober, yeah, just yeah. you know, going because I started back doing shows and going in, in those venues and um, and just you know, it's tough to. They say you have to maintain a, an internal atmosphere of recovery. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? But um, just I guess my recovery wasn't strong enough. You know what I'm saying? Because I would never, like, I've never been the person to get up here and on a platform and lie and act like I was sober or something because I have too much respect for those people in those rooms, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the program. And uh, I know how hard it is, man, to go through life and, and truly live life on life's terms. You know what yeah. I'm saying? It's really not easy, you know, and I know I have a mental thing somewhere in my, I haven't found the right, um, even though I will say mushrooms do like is mm -hmm. the closest microdosing mushrooms is the, and I don't have a problem saying this publicly, is the closest thing that I've found to like, you know, being able to give myself some balance and peace, mm -hmm. you know, um, because I've done every drug except PCP in my life. You know what I'm saying? What, what had it took seeing you the worst? Um, opiates. Yeah. Like, like opiates what? and, and, um, and meth. Yeah. And I, that's the first time I ever admitted that publicly, yeah. like, like that I struggle with, you know, I'm, I'm clean off meth for nearly six months now, but, oh, that's awesome, man. but, um, and I, and I went to rehab and, um, you know, this was before and I was clean for a few months and, um, and, you know, I, I, I never would have ever thought there would be a time where, where I would, would say that like um that I had a problem with something like meth, you know what I'm saying? Like I never I but I I say this because I want to empower other people, you know what I'm saying? I I want I want people to understand that like you know, nobody we we as children don't decide that we want to become you know, criminals or or drug addicts or anything right. like that, you know what I'm saying? It's like and and, and I never was a person that judged people. You know what I'm saying? I never yeah. was a person that said, that would tell people, you know, um, in my many times in and out of the rooms of, of, of AA and NA, man, like it, it was never, um, I never was a person that sat in judgment of people or, or said, but I remember people saying that there's a lot of yets, you know what I'm saying? There's yets. Yeah. And, um, and, and I remember having opiate problems, you know what I'm saying? Thankfully, I came in pre-fucking fent fent fentanyl, fentanyl, yeah, yeah. you know, but I um, I was really, it was a time where I was, you know, snorting 10, 15, 10 to 15 Roxy 30s a day. Oh, wow. You know, there was a time where I really couldn't have ever seen there being a time where I lived without opiates. And I will say that, like, Suboxone is a part of, like, a lot of people talk down on Suboxone, man, but yeah. Suboxone was um, a big part of my story, man. That's that's the only thing that ever would allow me to, it got me a foothold, you know what I'm saying, yeah. away from, and the thing about Suboxone is, where I say it gets a bad rap, is, like, Suboxone, you can take two to four milligrams, of the, your tolerance level doesn't go up, whereas if I'm taking, like, Percocets or or Roxy's, your tolerance level fly skyrockets. You know what I'm saying. So what it took to do 15 milligrams, you know, might have got you high yesterday. It takes 30 today, 45 the next day, and so mm -hmm. on and so on. Before you know, you're snorting fucking 15 of the motherfuckers a day. But mm -hmm. um, but with Suboxone, it's like you can once you're on that two to four milligrams or whatever, you know, you're gonna stay there. You know what I'm saying? And it's it's regulated and it's not elite. You know what I'm saying? Because the thing is, is with this fentanyl stuff, man, it's just, I don't, you know, I am yeah. I haven't experienced one, one experience with fentanyl. I almost died and uh, I didn't know what it was. This is like 2017 or something. Oh, so that was early on. Yeah. And I, and I had, I had uh, done 
been on subs for about a year and then got off everything for like a year. Mm -hmm. And I was in a situation where like I was I was trying to get something done and I, and I, I was like, you know, do you have a lower tab or something? I was like sick or something. I was just gonna take a lower tab to get through and sh and complete the to shoot the video that I was trying to shoot. Yeah. And basically, it was a um, a R a Roxy, you know, and it was like a snort like a little piece of, and, and it was a line about that long. For some reason, I snorted that much of it, and if I snorted the whole line, I would have been dead. Something just told me not to not to do it. I didn't know anything about fitting, you know. Yeah, because that was before. It was it. told to me as it was a uh, it was a Mexican oxy. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know what the fuck that was. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And uh, yeah, you know, I, I turned blue. You know, this is 2018. I was still married at the time. Yeah, I turned blue. Woke up and you know, it, 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 it was a real fucked up situation. Anyway, mm -hmm. like, and and. In um, retrospect, I did recently figured out what the fuck was going on and what had happened, you know what I'm saying? Because I had even, we used to get uh, patches of fentanyl, you know what I'm saying? Or those lollipops and stuff. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between fentanyl that's like, you know, regulated and in, in, in the pharmacy yeah. and what this shit is, whatever it is, coming from China and Mexico. Like yeah, this, different, yeah. Yeah, like this stuff, this stuff is just pure poison, you know? And they're putting it in everything now, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and you know, my, my dear friend and brother Scram, man, you know, has had two heart attacks in the past year. You know, and I hope he doesn't mind me saying that, that we were living similarly, you know what I'm saying? And so mm -hmm. that was part of the eye opening thing. You know, he's either the same age or a little older, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like people just in general are out here, at, you know, people in their thirties have heart attacks and die. No, for sure, bro. You know what I'm saying? And, and, uh, you know, I'm so blessed because first of all, I look great to be my age, you know what I'm saying? Look at that yeah. head of hair. I mean, that's a middle-aged man. Like, I ain't never yeah. had no surgery or nothing, man. Like, <laughs> oh, love me. No. But, uh, you know, yeah. but, I, um, but I'm blessed, man. I still have my wherewithal. You know, I'm, yeah. I still have my wits about me. Um, but it's, um, you know, my battle with addiction, man, is uh, it's such a double-edged sword, man, because I have um, benefited as much as I've suffered from. The, it's like we talked about, like, I can become obsessed with, like, the way I am as an MC. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? It's the same, the same mechanism that serves me and making me meticulous, mm -hmm. making I'm an absolute with wordplay and with rhyme mm -hmm. schemes and with and just you know I'm a I'm a freak you know what I'm saying yeah. like the people wouldn't understand you know like the time that I, that I put into this craft you know what I'm saying like it's really mm -hmm. like I you know you don't you as an MC Chad you know because like you know that um you know, what they, what's that? they say 10,000 hours of anything. Yeah. Well, I'm probably at about 40,000 on I'm this sure. shit. You yeah, know what too. I mean? Yeah. And, and and you know as an MC, mm -hmm. man, you know, you know, we, we, we're we able to spot one of our own, you know what I'm saying? And I, I'm sure, you, you know, you, you, as somebody who sits down to, do, to that does this and has for years such as yourself, I'm pretty sure it's not a mystery when you, I take pride in the fact that you can tell that that, that I put a lot into to my craft. You know what yeah. I'm saying, and um, and every bit of that is because of the same part of my brain that makes it where, I, you know, mm -hmm. where drugs can. It's like if I anything that I like doing, I'm gonna do it till it makes me sick. Yeah, whether it's uh. The new cheeseburger, yeah. fucking Wendy's. Yeah. 
whether it's, you know, hell, me and Charlie went to the damn Wendy's and got that bag, that five for five. Absolutely. And I, and I was just blown the fuck away at this fucking, did you get all this shit for $5? Especially in 2024, And bro. it tasted, you know, and it was fresh. And I yeah. was like, what in the fuck, man? Like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? With the nuggets and the, man. Yeah. You know, I'm sure it's pure dog food. Like, yeah. but shout out to them for that. Wendy's, you know? cut the check. Yeah. Cut the check, Wendy's. Come on, Wendy's, quit playing. I don't know if I need to leak Wendy's butthole, whatever, <laughs> man. We'll, 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 we'll take care of all that behind Hell the scenes. Hell yeah, yeah, mama. Make it happen. No, but that's... Uh, but uh, but you feel what I'm saying? No, like, I'm like it's, it's, it's unfortunate. You know what I'm saying? It really is that it's just the same part of the brain. Like, what makes us great is what... Is what will destroy us too. You know what I'm saying? And uh Salute to you for, for being six months off the of meth though. Yeah, man. man. You know, and, and it's not easy if it if it seemed easy for me to sit there and say that on this camera, that I that I um you know, it wasn't mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's not, you know what I'm saying? Cause I know I know what people will fuck y'all. First yeah, of all, suck my dick, fuck, yeah. suck my dick. I still got more money than you. Yeah. Like you know what I'm saying? I yeah. Still come fuck your wife. I won't tell you. No, I'm just <laughs> But um, right. But you feel what I'm saying? No, 100. Like, but but I'm it's hoping. A lot of curves to do that. Bro. I'm hoping that somebody out there, you know, will hear that, and will you know that they can. Mm -hmm. Because, man, because it can be a desolate, isolated place, man, where you really feel, even. Amongst people, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's like, and then that mess is a dirty, dirty thing. You know, from the standpoint of like, it uh, it isolates you in a way like nothing else, man. Like it just, it really, cause you don't feel like um, you don't feel like anybody can relate to it, man. You know what I'm saying? You don't feel like anybody could. You know, it's so shameful. Mm -hmm. you know, for for somebody like me, you know what I'm saying? And I just, you know, and it was my it was my fucking guilty. What I got? I would say guilty pleasure, but it wasn't mm -hmm. very pleasurable there, you yeah. know, for a while. But how long were you? How long were you doing that? Uh, here's the, here's how it went for me, uh -huh. and I and I'll say this because it started with Adderalls. Yeah. People don't understand Adderall is legal meth. Right. It's the same thing. If you're taking Adderall, you're doing meth. Don't be yeah. judging people that do meth. You yeah. know what I'm saying? They're just getting it cheaper and getting something with more bang. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Um, just because your doctor prescribes it does not free you of, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. not, I don't give a fuck. Like, you need to find, a, if, if, you're, if you're leaning on Adderall, you're doing meth, accept that. And if you could do that, then cool. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. But um, do not think that you are, I don't care what that fucking bullshit ass quack prescribed you. You know what I'm saying? I don't, I really don't care. Like this, if it's not a a life saving fucking, you know what I'm saying? Like, like pres something that an ailment, if it's just cause you just, you know, you just get tired after lunch, you know what I'm saying? Drink a fucking coffee. Yeah. Um, but, um, it started with that, man. I'm telling you, like when I when I signed was Slim American, mm -hmm. 2016, 15, 16. Yeah. You know, I I admit that my craft had gotten dull a little bit at the time because, uh, you know, I just been signed to Average Joe's and it was more about making just trying to figure out how to connect with that base of people and you know what I'm saying like the country folks era you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. but it wasn't about like emceeing you know what I'm saying it was mm -hmm. more about a cultural me trying to figure out how to do it and so maybe my my pen you know I don't know mm -hmm. I, it, it was what it was right but when I started fucking I was I read a comment once again said if if Bubba's gonna be over here would, would he better step his shit up? Mm -hmm. And I re, you know, I and they were right, you know what I'm saying? Like at the time, like Ritz and you know, what I'm saying those guys yeah. were, you know, I mean to this day, Yellow Wolf, man, as talented a person as I've ever known. Yeah. And uh, and as his he he on accident is. An incredible MC, like mm -hmm. he doesn't even love rapping like that, dude. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. he, he, he just, 
his, I always say his mouth yeah. to his, I mean, his brain to his mouth and the ability, man, it's just something serious, bro. Yeah. Him and Rich both. You uh, know what Rich I'm saying? Is another, Rich is another one. You can't beat them guys. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Like, if you, if you just trying to, like, or you, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, the only way you can you can counter them counter motherfuckers is by just doing you. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, because yeah. that, that's the one thing. Like, and so when I got around those guys, it was like, and struggles just coming home. Yeah. And we had a powerhouse over there now. Like, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Cook ups coming into the mix. Shout out, shout out Cook Ups. Shout out the Cub, man. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, and being around those guys, man, at at thirty five years old, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like, it 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 fueled me. But short story long, I started when I discovered Adderall at that time. You were trying to keep up. Is that it, what you was trying? Well, to, I was just. At? It just helped. Like all yeah. of a sudden, I took Adderall. And it's like I'm doing records like Ghost and shit. Like and love put in record. work. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Ghost is my favorite record I've ever recorded. Yeah, I love that record. So you, you you start taking that, and you feel like things just kind of like the well, the lanes. I'm also up? going through a. Um, God bless my ex wife, man. Shout out to her. She's happy and married and has a, a beautiful uh, little boy and like I mean, I'm I'm, yeah. I'm but at the time. I'm trying to cope with, you know, our marriage isn't going great, you know, mostly because of my own doing, right, but, right. but, um, our, our marriage isn't going great. And, and, uh, and we are arguing quite a bit, you know what I'm saying? And, and what, what, uh, Adderall allowed me to do was I would take Adderall and then her and I would get in an argument and I'd be able to go zoom, zoom right mm -hmm. back. You know what I'm saying? And it allowed me to focus in a way that I had just, I needed Adderall, basically, like, right. you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I just didn't need to, eventually, I'm taking 10 of them a day. Right, right. <laughs> I didn't need to do that. But, um, man, like, in our chemistry, me and Wolf's chemistry is, he produced that project, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. He didn't he didn't make all the beats, but he executive produced and just, man. Love that handle that record, too. Man, that's, yeah. that's yeah. man, that, that, here's what I, I want to publicly say, Wolf. Yeah. Can we complete the Bubba Mathis project? Can we yeah. let's do the second half? <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. that shit is special, bro. Like, yeah. like that's that I say deliverance. Actually, I like Deliverance is probably my third favorite. Like, as far as my my personal Okay, yeah, yeah. You know, I the charm is probably my favorite yeah, Bubba Sparks album. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But dude, like Honestly, I would say the Bubba Mathis EP is is either my favorite or tied for. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I was on fire, yep. and and our chemistry, you know what I'm saying, was just impeccable at that time. Yeah, and I would love to any time, man. Wolf is is game for it because you know life happens, man, and and and, um, and you know we kind of got cut short on 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 that. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, and so, man, to ever be able to go do that second half of that, like what we originally set out to do, man, yeah. it would be beautiful. But, um, yeah, so I start doing Adderalls, mm -hmm. and then that turns into Molly. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know, you know, first of all, if you're out there doing Molly, there's only one molecule difference between Molly and meth to begin with. Mm -hmm. Like pure Molly, you're not doing pure Molly. You're doing meth. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? If you've been out here doing the pink Molly and all that shit, you're doing fucking meth. Period. Yeah. And then um, circumstances led to where, of course, at a certain point, I ain't got no more of that, but I got this. I'm mm -hmm. like, damn. It had a stigma, so I'm like, eh. yeah. this is 2020, something like that. Yeah. Give me a little bit just to get by. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Just so. Because unlike the opiate withdrawals, the opiate withdrawals physically are just yeah. hell. This is a mental withdrawal, though, that is wicked on top of wicked. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I, uh, pistols to your, you know what I'm saying? Like, not, yeah. not, not, not the, the closest I've ever been to, to doing something to myself was, was, uh, was completely sober, but I've had thoughts, you know what I'm saying? It's like, damn, man, like it just really takes you to a bottom, like mentally of just hopelessness and despair that you really could never imagine. Yeah. And, um, and then it turned into M-E-T-H, yeah. O-D, man. Yeah. But, um, 
Yeah, and it just um, it's cheap as fuck. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you know what I'm saying. And, and uh, next thing you know, uh, just till I can get by turns into you know three years. So I'd say three years. You know what I'm saying. But that was the the latter. But you know it stuff like I had talked to my family for two years. Mm -hmm. You know, I was I was following my divorce, you know what I'm saying? And I, I guess I like something I read on social media a lot. Like nobody's coming to rescue you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like even as as me, you know, but uh, yeah. you know, nobody's coming to rescue you, bro. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Like you gotta get up and do it for yourself, you know, and and I'd say the closest thing to somebody coming to rescue me, you know, my boy Big Josh. Mm -hmm. You know, people were there for me, don't get me wrong. My boy Big Josh, Scram, um, uh, you know, Charlie P, man, yeah. mainly, like, honestly, yeah. like, Charlie P, you know, met me at probably my absolute lowest point in in, in life yeah. and was a friend to me and a brother to me, and I will absolutely jump out a window and take a person's head off their shoulders about about Charlie P and yeah. go go sit in a box or yeah. in, until 2179, like, yeah. Yeah. you know what I'm saying, because... He has, um, he's been a brother to me. Like, it's like, it's like a Doc Holiday. you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah. like, you know, Charlie P is my friend, mm -hmm. you know? Hell, I got lots of friends. I don't, Yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, so here's what I want to do for, to, to, to cap off this, because we're going to do a lot more of these, but. And if you want to make this a continue, like. No, you, for sure. We definitely will. Because, because, because I feel like we could. I know you just wanted to get something done, bro. But I want to scrape the surface, but then what we can keep, we can do as many as you want, bro. But I'm saying, if you want to do a documentary, on, like yeah, yeah. I need that, man. Like we'll I, do that, dude. me and Charlie P were just talking about that last night. It's like I think yeah. that would help Buck. I think Buck's never told his real story. Yeah, we've been trying. To, we've been waiting on Buck to do one of these and the podcast. I know it's coming. I thought the Starlito one turned out good, man. Oh yeah. Um, here's what I want to do to end this this first one that we do. I'm just gonna ask you a simple question, right? Uh, well, it may not be too simple, but we'll Come see. on. Who is Bubba Sparks? Bubba Sparks is uh, your maybe father. <laughs> nah. <laughs> Bubba Sparks, man, is... Uh, man, I hate this because it always reminds me of that movie Anger Management. Yeah. When when Jack Nichols is yeah. sitting there, he's the like, no, no, sim don't tell me about your personality. <laughs> Simply, who are you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's like, I mean, I'm a nice guy. I, you know, yeah. But that's kind of how I feel. But, uh, man, Bubba Sparks is a, is a man who loves love. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, um, man who overcame a lot of fear and still daily, you know what I'm saying, joust mm -hmm. with fear. Not fear of anything in particular, but that gnawing fear yeah. of just, oh, if I walk outside, if I go be uncomfortable, I might melt. Yeah. And I, and I, But I've learned the value of walking through that. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? You're not going to melt. Walk on through that. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? And you're going to, there's, there's strength on the other side of it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And, and, uh, Man, I'm. I love hip hop music and culture. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Like it's done. I'm just a man that that. I love this shit, man. I yeah. love this music and culture. It changed my life in way. It is my religion. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I. I, I mean, the church. None, none of that stuff. To be honest with you, I believe. In in a rhythm to the to the spheres, like yeah. I, I really do, but but and I believe in in God, I mm -hmm. do, but nothing spoke to me. This is what God used to reach me. You yeah. know what I'm saying? This music and this culture started amongst these black and brown people in the Bronx, New York, in the '70s. Like yeah. it came, found me, my ass, sought me out, didn't leave me a choice on a dirt road, 20 minutes north of Lagrange, Georgia. And it took me all around this world, man. Mm -hmm. You know, millions and millions of dollars I made. Mm -hmm. You know, most in pissed away. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But, but I, I ain't never been. I've never been like 
money don't make me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I've never been a person to a very much to a fault. I don't give a fuck about money. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like it's it's the dream for me. Yeah. And my life if I if I die walk out of this room, somebody shoots me in the head or Charlie P picks me up and God forbid we get in an accident, like mm -hmm. man, I have I think about that movie Blow. Yeah. When George Young at the end, he's like, I wouldn't say that my ambition far exceeded my talent. But I just relate to the spirit of, of of everything that he was saying. Like life passes most people by while they're making grand plans for it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And I have, to a fault, lived every fucking day. Like, mm -hmm. like there was. It it cost me a marriage. Mm -hmm. It it cost me. Um, I I don't have a family. You know what I'm saying? I don't have any kids. Yeah. I want I want kids. Yeah. But but living for today, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, like preventing me from having those things. You know what I'm saying? Just yeah. and um because I, I know it's always right now. Mm -hmm. It really is, you know what I'm saying? It's it's yeah, what Kung Fu Panda. Yeah. Yesterday's a mi yesterday's history, tomorrow's a mystery, and today's a gift. That's why we call it the future, motherfucker. Yeah. But um man I, I'm grateful. Yeah. I really am. And, and and man, if you see me, if if I think most people would say, if I owed you, you know what I'm saying? If if in some way shit got fucked up and I owed you, just I paid a lot of people back. You know what I'm saying? I went, if I still owe you, man, just if you just approach me like a human being, dude, I I promise you. Yeah. I don't I don't wanna leave no clutter out there, man. I don't wanna have no ill will out here towards nobody, man. Like yeah. I really don't. And I'm not fucking scared of you. You know, yeah. I promise you. Yeah. I, yeah. You know, I'm scared of myself. Mm -hmm. But cause a lot of people out here love me, big dog. <laughs> I'm telling yeah. you. And uh, you know, I just um I probably saved a lot of you motherfuckers, honestly. Like yeah. But, you know, if you just come at me like a human, if if, if somehow we got across, man, like I, I promise you, I don't, I don't want no enemies out here. I really don't. And that's from just, I, I, cause I walk around with a spirit of love, man. I wanna, yeah. you know, and as you get older, you start thinking about your legacy, Chad, you know what I'm saying? It's like, mm -hmm. what is my legacy? Mm -hmm. You know, I think about um, the movie um, Gladiator when he's like, will, will my legacy be one of you know, uh, a king that fucking like, you know, or, or, or will my legacy be one of love and love? like, did, did I give life or did I take life away? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And not, a, not saying I'm a fucking, you know, but I'm a king of my domain. Yeah. And if and if you're a country boy that does some, you know, that, that, that loves rap and, and you do rap and I ain't saying you owe me nothing other than just to Holler at a player when you see me on the street, trick. <laughs> nah, man, just, you know, man, I you don't owe me nothing, you know what I'm saying, other than just, just um, respect. And that's what I'll give you, too. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, and, uh, and shout out to all those that came before me. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, Southern hip hop and country hip hop are very tied. You know what I'm saying? The 8-Ball MJGs, mm -hmm. Three Six Mafias, the UGK, the Dungeon Family. Um, you know, that's, a, that's, that's I guess this this new generation, Chad, they don't, it's not a thing to pay homage to your predecessors. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, right. It's like, that's we can, we're we we're very big believers in that. You know what I'm saying? I know you are. And, um, you know, I just, uh, I don't know, man. There's so much I want to say, but there's like, um, you know, I just, I just wish I could, could make my heart, you know what I'm saying? Everything that's in my heart, man. Like I, because I owe this culture so much, man. I owe this, um, man, it's just, you, you know, when I think like what my life might've been, like if you took, think about your life minus hip hop. 
Like mm-hmm. hip hop never existed yet. Like just yeah. think about it. Like yeah. it's your purpose. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It gave you a purpose. You were probably confused as a youngster. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's I said it on uh on that song handle that. You know what I'm saying? When I'm like uh um we all was conflicted. I gripped mine and got it in. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's like we a lot of us. Hey man, I ain't never gonna be on the white. What was me shit? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. if you white in this country, you had a little bit of a leg up on something. But but it's like, um, at the same time, man, like, I know us white boys, man, we're, we're very conflicted. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I hope my legacy, part of my legacy is saying, like, just be you, man. Go rock this shit. Be yeah. you, whatever the fuck you are. If you're Tom McDonald, if you're Up Church, mm-hmm. if you're fucking Adam Calhoun, if you're Dusty Lee, if you're Haste, what, whatever, mm-hmm. whoever you are, man, grip, go grab your nuts in the spirit of hip hop, yeah. and go be you and rock this shit and fuck a bitch. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. like that's that's really a big part of what I hope my legacy is, man. It's like that I was just. Whatever you are, man, you know what I'm saying? Embrace it and go rock, man. You know what I'm saying? Because you earned your seat here by loving this shit. You know what I'm saying? And by being authentic. So. Hell yeah, man. Well, I appreciate this, man. We're going to be doing a lot more of these, bro. But I, I'm glad that we was able to, to sit down and, and get a start on. Nah, that's what I look at. It's yeah. like, too, honestly, it's like a start, man. Because yeah. it was so much build up, Chad. And, you know, I was, I was really like. You know, there were a couple times there where it was really like, um, like, damn, this dude's going to fucking hate me. But, uh, you know, a couple times it was my bullshit, but a couple times it was more like, dang, this is just really fucking fucked up circumstances, mm-hmm. you know? But I I just really was putting a lot of pressure on us finally getting in and, and get, you know, getting connected and you and just basically letting you know that I really, really appreciate you and value I you. you and, I, and, I, and I wasn't, I wasn't ever like uh diminishing you know yeah. like i wasn't ever saying like i'm too big or like, yeah, yeah. come on man like yeah. hell no hell yeah man well i uh if you're doing a service out here man yeah and don't be bashful of dude rock that fucking music man you and one are killing this shit bro like appreciate it, though. You, you ain't gotta take a back seat to nobody bro right except you in your own head you know what i'm saying yeah. and hey and it's like there's been a lot of times where I wanted to quit, mm-hmm. but here's what I always tell myself. There's going to be a whatever you're trying to accomplish in life, no matter how far-fetched it may seem, there's going to be a you at some point. There's going to be a person that that does exactly what you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. At some point, there's going to be one. Why not you right now? You know yes. what I'm saying? Instead mm-hmm. of allowing that doubt to creep in and defeat you, you know what I'm saying? There's going to be a person that does, that has the... This is the DJ Vlad that kept it real with motherfuckers mm-hmm. and, and still is out here fucking got a fucking viable music career and is slaying shit. Yeah. There's going to be one at some point. Yeah. Why not you right now? Yeah, for sure. So don't, anytime that doubt creeps in, fuck that shit, man. Yeah, dude. And there's going to be a fucking motherfucker that was huge, you know what I'm saying, fucking 15 years ago, but stayed down and went through all kind of shit and came back and was fucking bigger than he ever was. Because mm-hmm. he kept his sword sharp, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I make better music now than I ever did, you know. And I re- and I really believe that. I was I was a uh, blessed to work with some great producers early on, but as far as like um, me, what I bring to the table, man. I and people be like sometimes like I just miss the old you. That was 15 fucking years ago, dude. Like, yeah, yeah. you expect me to stay... You, first of all, we're either growing or dying. We don't stay the same. So, would you... I don't get that. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. It's like, man... And if you just are obsessed with something... Some older version of me, go fucking listen to that. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Right. Like, you know, because this is where I'm at now. Yeah. You know, I'm a different person than I was in 2006. No, you know? for sure. And I'm grateful for every stop on the journey, man, but... But I promise you, if you got an open mind and heart and you listen, if you love hip hop music and you listen to what I'm doing now, you're going to fuck with it. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Like, so, you yeah, know, man, that's just what it is, man. Mm-hmm. Whatever you're trying to do in life, there's going to be a person that accomplishes it at some point. So it might as well be you right now. Thanks.
Let's get it. Yeah, man. Shout out to CV Bubba Sparks. Woo! You gotta love it.